My name is Dave Teruso, and I have the creative impulse. This is Jerry. This is Lane. This is Dave. And you are listening to the Critic Impulse Podcast. So you, can, so, so you consider yourself a Philly writer? What does that mean? I'm, you know, I haven't really lived anywhere else. I've lived in, I grew up in South Philly. I lived in Drexel Hill, Brew Mall, Norristown, Maniunk, and Roxborough. So I haven't lived more than a half an hour outside of the radius of South Philly in my life. And I don't really feel that I can talk knowledgeably about life in any other city because I haven't lived in any other city. I even went to school in Philly. So like I don't sit down and go, oh, I want to write about the Philly experience. And I'm not like when you read my stuff, you're not going to. It's not all about cheesesteaks and all that weird. You know, I, I, I don't identify with that. And I'm not trying to make it. I'm, I'm always trying to write universally. But what I realize is that my universe is a Philly universe and that if you're not from here and you read what I write, you'll get a good sense of what it's like to live here. What it, the things that I know about Philly that I've that I can talk about m- in my whole life that for me are natural, and I sometimes think they're universal until I find out they're not. Like when I was a kid, uh, growing up in South Philly, we were talking about this I think the other day about how we would know where somebody lived based on what parish they grew up in. It was a very Catholic for me area. Uh, you know, I was I lived in the Italian part of south philly and it was it was italian and irish very catholic so we'd say oh i'm from i went i went to epiphany of our lord so they oh where are you from i'm from epiphany then people knew within a five block radius where my house was without me telling them and everything was broken up like that so i kind of understand that sort of you know i describe philly south philly at least as and i guess really all of philly as a series of little towns that are connected with no spaces like each parish was its own town and you knew everything that was going on in that town and the gossip and stuff was very localized and it had that feel i mean you know people who never leave south philly can be very provincial and have that sort of small town feel to them of not having a sense of the world and i grew up in that and it's just the fact that the small towns touch each other and you can walk from one to the next in 10 minutes doesn't change that idea that it's all very small Towny, and I have that for somebody who grew up in a big city my whole life. I, I have this this kind of neighborhood, small town sensibility in my writing. I think are the characters infused with that? I think so because I can't. I mean, I try to. You know, Freud said everybody in your dream is you, and I think my writing is just dreaming. You know, on paper, and so I I, I hear a lot of like. Writers say like, oh, I try to write, you know, not about, I'm not writing about myself. I write about these characters. I don't think you can write about anyone but yourself or even even when you try to, it's always about the lens of your eye. You know, like if I try to write about Dave, the other Dave, I know the people listening can't hear this, but if I try to write about Dave White, I will do my best, but it will really be my version of Dave White and what I see of him, which is completely and totally biased by my life. Because I know how I would react if somebody did something. So when I see him react to something, I'm going to see it through that lens and go, like, I think he's really – that really hurt his pride when maybe he's not a prideful person like I am. And he might have just been like, oh, that was annoying or whatever. Uh, So, like, I really embraced – in my teenage years, probably like 17, 16, 17, I'm writing about myself and trying – my experience of the world. And I'm trying to relate to other people and I'm trying to write about other people. But really, I'm just trying to give people a, my view of the world and find the universal in the extremely specific, in my specific world, that there are things that are so universal because we, you know, we all have parents or our parents are gone. We all have, you know, friends and like all that stuff. It's universal. So just focus on you and kind of try to understand yourself. You're never going to. You will die not fully understanding yourself. And of course, you will die not fully understanding anyone else. But at least you have all day to kind of examine yourself and go like, well, why, why, why am I doing that? And and kind of I like I like the sort of 
when I, I learn a lot about myself when I'm done, when I read my book, when I step away from it, it's, there's something about the, the objectivity of the writing it down in a novel form that when I step away from it, I'm like, I, I know that I've been doing these things and I've never been able to ad- admit them to myself because they're ugly. You know, we all do ugly things that we don't admit and I'll put them in the characters and, be, and not realize it's me and then finish and go like, yeah, I need to work on that. It's funny. It's like, just crazy. You're a comedian and it's funny that often we, we take it for granted that comedians are such deep people or most of most comedians as, as, as deep and introspective as, as you are. Is that part of being a comedian? I do. I do think it is. I mean, comedians are, whether they're deep or not, they're dark, you know, uh, uh the there the, people always say like you know the most dark people depressing people are comics it's true i mean it, it comes out there's a people who want to be performing every night who, who go to open, open mics no matter what level they're at all the time and are performing all the time it's it's like a disease it, it's not healthy to want to do that all the time and there's something very unhealthy about it it's it's i think of it as like a disease with a very with a very um I don't know what the, what the word I want to use, but with like a very positive side effect. Like I, you know, comedians are people who have a problem. Well, what? Why is it unhealthy? Is it is neediness? It's very needy. It's very attention seeking, and it's just a it's a sickness. Well, it's, it's egocentric. It's very ego yeah, egocentric. To to you know to be a good stand up comedian and to be a healthy member of society are mostly antithetical, and you know. Uh, you can do both, and I know a lot of people who do both, uh, but they, they are kind of at odds with each other because one is is just, you know, make the joke at all costs, and the other one is be a person, be human, be nice to people, and don't... Well, does the end justify the means in that case? Because, I mean, you, you uh, comedians not only make people laugh and make people happy, they make people think. And they also, I think they also, they educate people. There, there's a larger sociological impact, I think, that comedians have on the world. Comedians say things and, and, and deal with issues that, that we're not, that people don't naturally deal with or are afraid to deal with sometimes. I wonder, you know, is it, is it worth all that? Is it worth all that suffering that Richard Pryor went through? Is it, is it, was it worth it because of the impact he had on, on society? Worth it to who? Worth it to society. I mean, that it was almost like they. So their pain, they suffered. Comedians suffered. Went through all this. You know, went suffered, but society benefited. The, uh, the end is, you know, like Star Trek does. The, the needs of the many outweigh the, the I, needs of the one. I think few. so. I mean, I don't. I don't want to. I, I think it's almost it's unhealthy to think in terms of like, oh, the the depression, the addiction, and all that stuff is worth it for society because that almost turns comedians into like you know sort of beasts like you know what i mean like slave beasts beasts of burden kind of thing where you know i don't i don't i think richard pryor would have been a good comedian without the addiction and robin williams would have been a good comedian without the depression they would have been different but they're still a they're still kind of a a a vessel of that stuff you know what i mean and it's you can't separate the two for sure but but uh, uh yeah i don't i don't think I don't think, oh, though, they made people laugh. That sort of, it doesn't justify their suffering because nothing does really. Nothing justifies the torture of like what Robin Williams went through. But it is this sort of amazing byproduct of it that is good. And I, I'm, I'm not saying comedians are sick and we all need to help. I'm, my therapist kind of gave me that feeling that he wanted to cure me of needing to be a, a comedian. And I don't want to be cured. I, I, It's a sickness that I like. I have two very specific sicknesses that I have been able to turn into something that are, is, I consider beautiful. You know, my two sicknesses are, one, I'm not a huge fan of reality. I like to escape from reality all the time. Join the club. and Right? And I'm just, I'm not great with reality, and I have to force myself to listen to NPR in the car in the morning and find out what's going on in the world. I just want to create another world and go escape in it. And, I mean, my writing is my escape. And when I can't, when I'm in between books, I start to get really uncomfortable after a while. Like, I've been in the real world too long. I need to go create another world to escape into. And that is the kind of what the sickness of the of the novelist is. You go be by yourself in a room for a couple of years at a time at creating this world that you can hide in. And that's not healthy. That is not the way to be a healthy person. But, but is, it, that, is that why stand-up comedy is so important here? Maybe it, keeps you, it put, forces you out into the world? Yeah, I think the, because the other sickness is I need to be funny. I need to make people laugh. I need to make them happy. Like I, I, there's, it's twofold. It's like the comedian A has an ego and wants to be funny. 
which is that's one part. I want to be funny. That's for me. That's ego. But I also want to make you guys laugh. That's for you. And the, that that disease that I have forces me out, keeps me uh, social. And what I'm finding is without one, I wouldn't be a healthy person at all. But with both, I have a thing to escape from that is very introverted and very quiet and allows me to find my center. And then I have this other thing that's very extroverted and lets me reach out to people and fosters personal relationships and, and that kind of stuff. So between the two of them, I'm a human. Um, I think of you as a humorist. Right. Um, when you're <laughs> actually in the process of writing your novel, do you ever do battle with yourself in that, you know, which comes first, the story, the characters, the reactions, or the joke? That? Sort of that Woody Allen thing where he said he knew he had become an artist at some point when he cut the funniest line from his movie because it just didn't fit. I honestly don't have that. I have an opposite... Um, thing. Let me. I'll explain. So, I the Cube Sleuth, which is the book that I published in January, uh, is this actually the seventh novel that I wrote. It is the first comedy that I wrote. The other six novels were serious because I, I th- as a kid, I thought I, I I wasn't reading satire and funny. I don't rem- remember reading funny books. I read you know, sci-fi and I read, um, adventure story. I loved mystery stories and they're pretty serious. Uh, so, you know, Sherlock Holmes is not hilarious. Edgar Allan Poe isn't funny. So that was what it was to me. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, I was very plot oriented. Like I'm a character driven writer, but I like story. I don't want to just read kind of literary fiction where nothing happens. I want a plot. I want you to, to develop these characters through the plot, let the plot embody them. So I grew up writing all these, ter- you know, I, they're terrible to me. Like they're pretty bad books um, that were, you know, based around those other things. And my those worlds were separate for me. I was a serious novelist. You know, I'm, I'm talking about. I was 12 years old when I wrote my first novel, 12 or 13. Serious novelist, and that was my hat. And then when I took it off, re- regular Dave hanging around Dave was just a constant sticky ham. I was, I was, and I mean, not that I'm not now, but I mean, I was unbearable probably by the time I got to college in terms of how much performing I did with my friends because I didn't have an outlet and I didn't, I wasn't self-aware enough to realize I need to be on stage and, and let this out. I have this need to perform that's not getting out. And it would just be like my, my friends and my girlfriend being like, what do you stop? Just cut it out. Um, but so I separated those worlds forever. And the, the, I, I, f- I fell into writing dark comedy by accident and kind of by the, by necessity. So I, I decided that I, at a certain point, probably after my s- sixth book, the one right before Cube Sleuth, I decided that I wanted to write all of my books in first person and present tense. And I wanted an immediacy and a personal feeling that I don't, I don't like past tense stories because I feel like it's already done. Mm-hmm. And I want, I know it's a story. But there's something about the present tense that gives you the idea that it's happening, it's unfolding for you, mm-hmm. and the people's fates aren't sealed in the way life feels. You know what I mean? <laughs> when I read a past tense story, I feel like I'm being told a story, and I know, well, this person is clearly alive because they're telling me. Mm-hmm. You know, so I know, I know they got out of it somehow, and I can tell from how they are that it's. But if it's in present tense, it's like that's when you're experiencing things when you don't know what's going to happen. So you know, I decided oh, I want to do that, and then. When I came up with the, with the idea for Cube Sleuth, the main character is just the very thinly veiled me. It's just Shmavid Shmarus. Like, I should have just called him that. He's me with, like, a few very important things changed for the to kind of make the character um, consistent. Because, you know, human beings are not consistent. No human being is a consistent character that you could put into a story. We're all full of contradictions, and we have to refine and distill a person to make that's what they do in you know biopics all the time that people are like well why they change that so because a human being is not a character they're two different things a human being is a bunch of contradictions that have a kind of a thing that goes through them and a character is that person with all the contradictions removed so that there's a one sort of distilled refined thing that is specific when i decided okay i'm gonna write this book where it's first person from me which i've never done and it was very hard and, and it like nearly ruined me and put it it was really hard to do and gave me panic attacks and a bunch of things because the book is super dark and the you know the what happens to the character is very tragic and stuff and it it really like messed with me to to delve that deep into myself i had never done that 
But what I've found was I couldn't not write as myself while being funny, without being funny. I had to be funny because I just – that's the voice I hear in my head. You know, the second book I wrote, Lost Touch, I, I based the main character on my friend Melissa is one of my best friends. And she's an Italian girl from, like, North Jersey. And she just has this really sarcastic Italian thing that I identify with as a, as a South Philly Italian guy. And she's the voice in my head when I wrote that book. And I told I told her that she knows she's on the dedication page and everything. Um, that I, I asked her first, like, is it okay? I really want to base this voice on you. And so I heard her when I'm writing, and I know how she says things. And she's, you know, she's just, she's like a sweet person who says a lot of like mean stuff, but she means it in a sweet way. Um, you know, when she, if you make her laugh, she'll be like, <laughs> idiot. And I realized like she's she's nice by being mean, which is something I identify with. I call it. Um, aggressive hospitality it's like in a very italian thing like here eat this you know eat these meatballs or i'm gonna shove them up your ass like that's not a nice way to offer something to somebody but that's how italians do it <laughs> and so you know i i have that voice in my head and writing cube sleuth was freeing because it was my own voice but i realized that i don't know how to even i mean the story is a very tragic story about a guy who has one friend and his friend commits suicide or allegedly and he thinks he's been murdered and he's really just grieving and lonely and kind of following people around because he's so alone. You know, that is the 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 heart of that story is this sad, lonely guy with no friends grieving. But it's also a murder mystery, you know, and it's the story is, is he on to something or, or not? Uh, so it's a very tragic story about this lonely person. And it was I'm I'm surrounded by friends, but I felt very lonely at the time. And I often feel lonely and isolated. And it was exploring that. So it's a sad story. And if somebody else in that story told it would have been pretty pretty sad pretty grim uh, but i when i tell you stories about sad things i find a way to make them funny because that's how i live and i won't i don't want to depress you if even if i'm telling you oh my god you know my so-and-so passed away i'll find something in it that was funny to lighten it up for you and i found myself doing that for the the imagined audience later and that it just set me free and all of a sudden i was like this is what i've been supposed to do my whole life and I wasted, not wasted 20 years, but I mean, I would have been way better at this had I done it before the book I wrote when I was 26 or 27. Like, you know, I, I should have been doing that. And Lost Touch is another funny, dark story. The alter ego books are funny, dark. And that's where I live. I realize that that's where I live. The, the, even my stand-up is funny with a darkness to it. That I, that's, that's sort of the, the two worlds put together. The novelist and the comedian come together in both worlds because my stand-up comedy has a darkness and a sort of a storytelling thing and my novels have a comedy so they're they're really intermingled they're one big world for me they're just two separate pieces are they just two separate outlets two separate outlets for i mean i just if if i you know when people say like well or even if i say i'm a novelist and i'm a stand-up comedian really i'm a storyteller no matter what i do write a song write a skit write a write a book write a stand-up bit they're all stories I'm just a storyteller. I'll always be telling. When I was a little kid, I used to line up all my stuffed animals in my closet and tell them stories. Like, do I guess it was stand up? Uh, I've always been a storyteller, and that's what this is for me. Is how many different ways can I do that? That's how I got into music, and like, oh, I want to learn how to write songs and write, play the guitar and play the piano, so I can tell more stories. So that's how I like link them together. Hi, I'm YouTube's Dave Teruso, and I'm here today to promote my debut novel, Cube Sleuth. Cube Sleuth is a funny, raunchy murder mystery set in an office. It has everything. Letters, words, punctuation, sentences, paragraphs, pages, chapters, parts, but that's not all. Plot, character, description, dialogue, setting, theme, backstory, protagonist, antagonist, conflict, climax, but no denouement. There's no denouement. It wasn't feasible. I'm sorry. Oh. Cube Sleuth is an e-book. A what you probably just said out loud because that word sounds like it comes from the future? E is short for electrical. It's an electrical book. You can read it on your computer, Kendall, Nano, Pad, etc. My mom read it. She loved it. Here's her actual Amazon review. Five stars. Just finished reading. It's an easy read. Page turner. Keeps your attention throughout. An entertaining murder mystery with a touch of humor. Do you think my mom's a liar? Do you? She's not. You're going to love Cube Sleuth. Buy it today at your local internet. It is one penny less than $4. Good night. I mean, it's a really dark book, and I'm not going to give away the ending of the book, but, you know, things don't turn out well for the protagonist. It's a very grim story. Just to, just to clarify, the mystery is 
that has to be solved is did this his friend actually commit suicide or was he murdered right and then and we don't really know that most of the story you're story, not gotcha. sure and then there's other things going on um but yeah i mean it was just it was imp- an important thing for me as an artist the most important thing i've ever done it's not my best book at all uh i'm proud of it uh but it's not my best book and lost touch is a lot better and i think the one i'm writing now is much better uh but it was it is and will always be the most important thing artistically I've ever done because I I was like, I went kind of like, I need to take a chance and do something I haven't done and really just stand naked in the mirror in a, like a 360 degree mirror with neon lights on and, and just explore every part of me, the good and the bad and just put it on the page and let people read it. And, and you know, I was very uh, frank about stuff. Like I had a an online poker addiction. This is true. I lost twenty five thousand dollars. I still paying off some of it, um, and that's in the story. And you know, it was a thing where I couldn't let my parents read the book because I didn't want them to know. I didn't want them to start giving me money. So they, my parents didn't read the book until it came out. You know, because by then we had already discussed it and all that. So there's a lot of stuff in there about like different things. There's a section in there that was the it's like the hardest thing I've written where I talk about all. The, Bobby Pinker is the main character of the book. He there's a page where he talks he gets cheated on by his girlfriend which didn't happen to me. Uh but he talks about how all the things about himself he doesn't like that he thinks is why he would be somebody you would cheat on. And I just wrote everything I could think of and just 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 brutally like me like that if someone said them to you you would you would cry or you would beat them up and just wrote this thing out and like for a long time, like I kept, I was like, I should take this out. This is too much. I don't want people to know this. No one's ever going to want to be with me if they read this kind of thing. And I, I struggled with that. And so, yeah, the, sto- the story has like, you know, a really, you know, grim. Th- it just gets worse and worse for him. It's so just, you're saying you left in this information? It's I did. really it's, revealing. It's, I didn't I didn't take anything out. And I, um, you know, it, it, if this, you know, there's just a lot of terrible things that happened in the story. And I found myself having nightmares about them and panic attacks and stuff and it just things got really bad for a while and it, it was uh by the time i was done the book kind of the things that i had done wrong in my life that were the plot of the book had ended i was in a six-year relationship and it kind of ended that relationship the the poker thing and that yeah. depression that went along with all that uh debt and all that stuff you know i'd ruined this six-year relationship that was like a marriage and um i actually put the book away for about two years because i couldn't finish it um uh, it was done, but I couldn't like go back to it because it, it upset me too much. Um, and you know, it, it, I think that writing the book sort of hastened that spiral for me of kind of like ungluing myself from all of this stuff. Like, obviously, the the for me at least, obviously the the depression and the the poker debt and all that stuff. It was all connected to things that were just wrong with me, my psyche in general, and you know. I started going to therapy after I was done the book and like got to a healthier place. But it was like, it pushed me to my own edge of kind of sanity sort of. So it was, it was, I, I don't think I'll ever do that again. Or I, I don't, I don't plan to. And it, you know, it, it's, it affected other people too. And like my ex-girlfriend is, is a character in the book and I, I let her read the book before anyone else. Cause I took from her life pretty specifically and said, I'll change anything you want, you know, and at the time, she she didn't make make me change anything. So I'm like, well, I'll take out whatever. It's it's, I'm, I'm not going to embarrass you for my for the sake of my book. And she didn't make me change anything. But then after we broke up, she told me that she really, and the book was like published. She said that she really didn't want all that information in there, and she felt kind of almost violated by it. That I had kind of, you know, violated her privacy with what I put in there. Um, and. Cause I, and I had, it's like when I published the book, I wanted to send her a copy because it's dedicated to her and a few other people and she didn't want it. She said, I don't, I don't want to have it. And, you know, I realized there's a line that I can't cross with that stuff, that I can only do that to myself. And even though, I mean, I got her permission, but I, I should have, I guess, realized that as my girlfriend, she wanted to please me and wanted, didn't want to stifle me as a writer. And she was just trying to do what she thought I wanted her to do. But really, I didn't. I wanted, I didn't want to... Uh, that, that 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 kind of mars the book for me that mm-hmm. that it, it causes somebody pain you know uh and i it was to a point where but i and i i just I couldn't bring myself to change it at that point like it was 
pretty much being published. And is like, that part of why you feel it doesn't measure up to your other books? No. Or is I, it like a therapeutic aspect I think, of it? I think it's, there's a thing about being too close to the, what you're talking about that you can't refine it enough. I was, it was, I, I put in too many details about me that I should have refined that people didn't need that. It was just, I, I got, I wanted to put everything of myself in there and that's not how you write a story. You don't, you don't pl- clog every detail of a character in a book so that people know who they are. You give them enough that they can kind of fill in the blanks and that there are some blanks. Mm-hmm. I didn't leave enough blanks. Mm-hmm. And um, I was really tied to the, I was tied to the sort of, um, to the reality of the world. And I, I didn't take enough liberties with it because I'm like, well, this is based on a real person or this is really what my job is like, or that wouldn't happen because I know that. And this, you know, like, well, this elevator doesn't, you got to get off in the, so I have to put that in the story. The, the elevator goes to the lobby and you got to get out there. Like that's, I, it bogged it down with that stuff. There's a, there's a friend of mine who's a writer who wants to don't once mentioned that sometimes books and writing are opportunities to, to play with your reality. So you, you, you can have your reality, but then you can, you can play with these, these play with like shifting. You start with it, but you shift things around and right. say, well, so this is my reality, but let's just change this detail and see how does that, how does that affect everything else? Right. And when I think just with that one book, I was too like reticent to change things that I should have changed. And I look at it now so many years later, I mean, I wrote it, <clears throat> I wrote the first draft, I think in 2007, so it's been eight years, and I can look at it now and be like, you know, that's not where I'm at anymore. And I, with all the other books, I've been able to, you know, play with stuff more because it's hard. It's hard to play with your life. It's easier to play with a story. When you say things you should have changed, are you saying that in retrospect you see that, or at the time you had a feeling? No, in retrospect, I think at the time I was just too mired in it to like to see it that way. And I, I you know what, I'm sure that. In eight years, when I look at Lost Touch, the book that's coming out in March, I'll have a similar. You're always going to do that as a as a as an artist. If you if you're an artist, I mean, to me, the definition of an artist is a, you know, pretty much a, a sort of like a a craftsman who evolves. Or work works in progress. Right. If you're not, if there's no evolution, then I don't find you to be an artist. I would find you to be a craftsman or something like that. Like if you look at like my favorite group is Radiohead. They kind of evolve from album to album, and that's what I like about them. And then it's like. Bon Jovi is like a good band to me. Like, but if you listen to a 1980s Bon Jovi or right now, they sound the same. They haven't evolved. They haven't really become artists in my mind. Mm-hmm. So that could be part of it. Just that, like, with that much time away from it, you've grown so much as a writer or whatever you do, a, a, a musician, or whatever, that you realize, like, I would have done that differently. And I kind of like, I like that song. I think you know this is the kind of George Lucas thing of like, I'm going to go back and yeah, I was thinking the same fix thing. that. Yeah. But to me, you know. In a very like home movies kind of way, like your book, that book is is a really, really, really detailed, refined portrait of what I was like when I wrote it and what was going on in my head. And I don't want to change. I would never want to go back and change it because I, warts and all, that is me. And you know, I don't write journal entries. I wrote <laughs> I wrote a journal for a couple of days when I was sixteen. I was so disturbed with how dark my thoughts were honestly that I like freaked out and I never did it again. I probably never will. But if you read all my books, you'll have a really deep sense of who I am without even knowing any like personal details. It just, it's, it's all there. It's all embedded in the story. Sometimes very specifically, I'll put real, I find for me, like the thing I'm working on the most is uh, behind the scenes kind of is like I'm trying to tell you where I'm at right now in my life and hide it in this story that is its own thing. The book I'm writing now is about a detective who's trying to uncover the secret identity of a superhero which has nothing to do with my life. And there's no part of my life that even vaguely seems like that. But I have, you know, the whole thing for me of the writing is how do I tell where I'm at right now uh, in the story, you know, and where I'm at right now is like, I'm at, at an age where like, I realize like, I think I do want to get married and have kids. I'm 35. I'm like ready in some way. And that's what the story is about. When I, when I look at it, I realize that is really what it's about. And, um, if I wrote it five years ago, it would be a different book. It would be the same story of a guy trying to find the secret identity of a superhero, but it would be different. And that, that's what I like about it. I, I like, and I think what makes a story unique is the author's, um, that tension that the author creates of like you can't help but be influenced by where you are right now, where you are that day, and if you were upset about something, or if you don't, if you if you say if you grew up like I grew up 
kind of like sometimes jocks would would bully me you know i was the smart kid that affects my writing and it's in there it's always it's all in there that those little prejudices of like i was i've always been kind of weary of of rich people i don't trust them i grew up poor and i'm just i don't trust people who like have a lot of money and seem to like have power if i feel like there's something shady about them like that all comes out in the stories well and i'm not trying to i can't help it i'm the lens and uh, you know there's no such thing as a reliable narrator if you ask me they can't help it and i like to just i really let go with that and go like let me just be me you know but do you start thinking about those biases after you've written, do you start thinking about that? Maybe I should rethink yes, my perceptions. And I do sometimes. It depends. If to me, it's it, it. Does it serve the story or does it not serve the story? Mm-hmm. If I can find a way to make it serve the story, I'll keep it in. If it's just kind of polluting the story, which it is a lot, I'll get rid of it. Um, polluting? You mean it's like self-serving? Or like, it's like taking it's, things off track? It's tainting the story. Like if the story is not about how you know I got bullied by jocks or something like well what's it doing there you know or like you know what i mean like why why is it in the has has nothing to do with the story like one thing i remember like i mentioned that i'm i'm lactose intolerant in real life and i mentioned that the main character of cube sleuth is and i remember my friend reading it and she wrote a note on the page that said why do i need to know that and i realized you don't and i just did it i just there's i should have said that's that's because there was no scene where he was actually being affected by it would would come up little, (laughs) little by little like there were there was a scene where they go to pat's and gino's as a kind of a joke, and he's saying, "I'm eating my cheesesteak sans cheese." Like I, w- because that's how I think. Well, that's tech, but could you argue that's texture? Adding in those little details. That's like how. That? I, that's why I left it in, and because I, I had that moment where I could have taken it out, but I was like, "This is, this is me." You know, maybe I, it was the moment when you revealed the characters <laughs> like those at all. Like, that that's what was not, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but not, and it does. So you just. I, I'm. Sh- I. I. You know, we we are all kind of it felt like you shoehorned that yeah, into the yeah. character. We're all we're all bigoted, we're all biased, and we can't help it. And it, they're all different. Everyone is racist in some way, sexist in some way. Everyone, everyone. And to think that you're not is ridiculous because we all have grown up with things that people have said that we don't realize aren't true until you're an adult. And so when I'm writing them, I um, I just I kind of I have to I have to put them on the page before I can even look at them to see. I don't even realize I'm doing it. So like okay. The alter ego book, uh, I I have this illustrator that's doing. He's doing. We're like co-authors. He's doing the pictures after I'm done, and I sent him the first couple chapters to read. And uh, there's a thing in the second chapter where there's a there's a girl in the comic book store, and she's wearing a like a Wonder Woman T-shirt, and it's really tight, and this like short short skirt. And the the detective comments to the reader basically that he got the sense from this girl that she was more interested in skinny boys who love comics than comics. And when he, Mike, the illustrator read it, he said, that's really sexist, you know? And I, and I was like, I guess it is. And I realized like, yeah, it is. And I was like, I think that that's the detective. And well, the detective is sexist. The, the, the detective that, that, is sexist. Right, though. right. It's character. Right. And I'm like, but that's the, and the, the, the detective has a lot of me in it. So I'm like, there's something in me that thought that, that had that thought, because I, I have had that thought. I've seen girls who, like, you can tell they're total comic book heads and they're loving it. And then you see girls, I'm like, I think you just want to date boys. But in wait the minute, story... Wait a minute, have you seen these girls? Where are they at? You, you, need, you need to go there? Okay. I'm not a skinny guy, but I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay, yeah, I'll find them for you. You were right, just pimp. So, so he points this out to me, right? And I'm like, that's a really interesting thing that i didn't you know you you do that all that we all do that stuff where we make comments and we're like "Mm, that's sexist that's 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 racist that why did you say that i mean like what why why did you have to tell me that the guy in that story was puerto rican what did that have to do with anything i don't know i don't know why he couldn't just like if he was white you wouldn't have said he was white why did you have to tell me that he was chinese like i don't get it it's cultural thing that's an oh my god that's a whole show right there yeah you could tell right so so he tells me this thing and i start thinking about it and i realize like that I do want to address it in the story. And so uh, I address it later, that that moment of where he thinks that she, and, and, and what she actually turns out to be. And it ends up being this awesome clue to what's going on in the story. And so that's a, a moment where addressing it is really adding to the story for me. And I kinda, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to work with this guy. Uh, his name's Nick DiStefano. He's good, that's doing the artwork because he he and I seem to like butt heads on this stuff. And I, that I like that tension, you know, writing is a total solitary mm-hmm. thing. Uh, Stephen King describes it as uh, sailing to England alone in a bathtub, 
you're just alone and so you're 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 free to be whatever you are and like uh, the thing i loved about sketch comedy that was probably my it's my favorite thing i've done comedy wise is the sketch comedy stuff is because i had other people to bounce things off of and matt the guy that became started out a quartet and then two guys left and it was just matt and i uh we, we butt heads on a lot like not not in an unhealthy we didn't fight we didn't yell at each other but his aesthetic and my aesthetic there's a lot of places where they really flow together and a lot of places where he just didn't want to go there and usually in both cases with the guy who's doing the artwork it's a thing of like that's too far that's too vulgar that's too dark it's too whatever and rein it in and i kind i kind of like that like there's a, there's a there's a like a, a a nudity in the new book and and my the illustrator he's not comfortable depicting what i wrote he's like i don't want to do like i wrote out very specifically what i wanted to see and he's like i'm not comfortable drawing that mm -hmm. um and so we started talking about it and you know at first i was like oh this is going to stifle me in some way that he won't draw the thing that i want people to see but when i thought about it and kind of came up with a new way to do it that he would like that wouldn't offend him kind of not offend him but it was just a thing he was not comfortable drawing and if i don't want to tell you what it is i don't want to talk about it in, in this but you would understand why it's uncomfortable um but what i came up with i actually like a lot better i i the the, the sort of this more classy image where some things are kind of obscured uh there's a tension in it in the in the composition of the picture that wasn't there before the picture was just kind of a uh, uh, voyeuristic thing and with this new the composition i had to come up with of like well this guy would be here blocking this so you wouldn't see this naked thing like actually makes the shot for me and uh so i'm like i'm excited by that kind of stuff and, and i like i like that tension i, I like i don't i don't want to work with people who feel exactly the same way as i do because what's the what's the merit in that for either of us well uh it's been great having you here today, Dave. It's been great being had here. It's an honor. <laughs> Probably not said and right, but having you in our place and coming to South, my place in South Philly, and hanging out with us and talking. And would love to have you back sometime again. Absolutely. Talk about something that's been great. Would before you go, could you talk about some of the things that you're working on? Sure. So, um, well, the big thing is is Lost Touch, my second novel, my sophomore novel. <laughs> I like saying that. Uh, it comes out March 29th from. Full Fathom 5 Digital, uh, fullfathom5digital.com. Uh, and uh, it's an ebook only. Um, I'm going to be the geek of the week for geekadelphia.com either this week or next week, I believe. I did the interview last Sunday. Um, I now am hosting uh, permanently the National Mechanics Pub Quiz Wednesday nights, 8 o'clock. It's National Mechanics is on 3rd Street uh, between... Market and Chestnut in Center City, Old City. And um, I have a, a website called DaveTeruso.com where I post. It's It's got pretty much an anthology of everything I've ever done in comedy. It's got it's got all my sketch videos. It's got all my stand-up stuff. It's got uh, blog stuff. Uh, we used to do a thing called, we just finished last week, a thing called Story Tag where um, the four of us, the four members of Animosity PR, my sketch group, would do... Um, a story, an improvised story through email, a hundred words at a time. I'd write a hundred words, email the next guy. He'd write the next hundred. You'd only have a half an hour to write your hundred words after you read the previous entries. Uh, and so we've kind of uh, scrapped that because it didn't, it didn't end up working out that well. Now we're doing a thing called topic tag, where we're just somebody's going to start a topic and record themselves talking about it for five minutes, send it to the next guy, and then they're going to record the next five minutes. And at the end of every week, I'll have this twenty-minute podcast to kind of put up. Uh, and the other one is officehorrorstories.com, where every Monday to Friday I put up user-submitted uh, content of quick, funny stories about your job, whether it's an office or if you're a waiter or a chemist or whatever. Just any funny thing that you think uh, is worth it. Uh, if you want to submit them, go to officehorrorstories.com. I'm always looking for stuff. I run out almost every week, and I'm like begging people <laughs> to give me more. Hopefully, it'll catch on soon, and they'll be more than but it's really funny like a quick it's a fun like you just see the picture every day and it takes a second to read it and then you move on you laugh and you move on some of the stories are hilarious to me that i'm like can't believe that that really happened and they're all true as far as i know unless people are making them up they always feel real they always feel real this it's contact at davidrusa.com you can send me an email i don't use anyone's name i even will obscure any detail you want, or you can do it yourself before you send it to me. To protect the innocent. Yeah, of course. Or, or the, the guilty. So, or the not-so-innocent. Right. Good night! Good night!